morning. I call the third general session of the 48th Annual Conference of the Enlisted Association of the National Guard of the United States to order. Call on the Secretary for any administrative announcements to start out the day. Good morning. I just want to remind everybody that committee reports will be due by COB today, and you can send them to secretary at ingus.org. I'll start uploading those committee reports to the 2019 folder on the website. And someone asked about motion forms. Uh, I'll have those on the floor uh, after the nine or after the first break this morning. If you have questions about that, you can bring them to me at the break. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time, are there any host state announcements? So I hope you all had a good time last night. I think it went over well. Each state needs to identify a flag bearer for the banquet tomorrow night. Rehearsal will be in here immediately following the PD session today. Uh, Arkansas wanted to announce that their raffle for three five-night stays ends at 1600 tomorrow afternoon. Uh, go register today. They're tearing their booth down at 2 o'clock this afternoon. So if you want to early registrate for next year, do that as soon as you can, after the guest speakers, obviously. Uh, and area chairs, we need your numbers for the banquet so we can finish the layout from each of your states. Take that to the op cell. Thank you. Thank you. Madam President. Sergeant Arms. We have a distinguished guest joining us today, the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, Major General Retired James Stewart. Sergeant at Arms, please have the distinguished guest escorted to the head table. The Honorable James Stewart is currently performing the duties of Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. In this capacity, Mr. Stewart serves as the principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense. Mr. Stewart retired from the Air Force as a Major General after 37 years of service. So formal. Well, I just wanted to thank a few folks first. First of all, the president of the Enlisted Association of the National Guard. Karen, thank you for your leadership. Thanks for inviting us. I know that Frank Hokum, or Frank, excuse me, Frank Yoakum is out there. There's Frank in the back, uh, was the instigator behind getting me here. And so uh, we did that uh, after a visit that he had to the Pentagon. And so uh, we're happy to be here, and thank you, Frank, for the invite, because we really are enjoying ourselves. The conference chair, which is uh, Dean Kennebuck, and I guess Angela is your wife, and both of the two of you, actually, she's the uh, auxiliary president, isn't she? So, so thank you, I appreciate it very much. Uh, the Iowa State President, Joe Steele. So Joe, thank you, and uh, Iowa Tag, who's my good friend, Tim Orr, uh, who is not here, but again, Tim has been a great friend over the years. I know that General Carter Ham uh, was supposed to be here. I know he headed off to uh, North Carolina, which is the state that I retired into. Uh, so I saw North Carolina over there. So good to see you from North Carolina. But he's at Bragg today. But he does have his battle buddy here, Ken Preston, the former Sergeant Major of the Army. So good to see you again, Ken. And then uh, I understand that we have uh, Catfish Rice, who's here, National Guard Director. He's not here right now, but I understand he's going to be here. And then the two speakers after me, both uh, are tags of great states, Wisconsin and Montana, uh, Major General Don Dunbar and Matt Quinn, who are back there, and they'll be talking to you after me. They actually have slides. I don't have any slides. 
But again, hopefully I'm riveting in as far as the information that I provide to you. So, uh, so again, we, we thank all of you for inviting us here. It's a great pleasure. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about the National Defense Strategy. And not only the National Defense Strategy, but some things that we actually are doing in the personnel and readiness portfolio that will impact the National Guard in the long term. But before I do that, I want to talk directly to all of you citizen warriors out there today and the entire National Guard family. I'm really grateful for the vital contributions to our national security that you provide each and every day. You keep our skies free from danger, you respond to disasters with, compens with compassion and professionalism at a moment's notice. You stand in the homeland and deploy around the world on the edges of democracy's frontiers. You've responded to your nation's call in Iraq and Afghanistan for over 18 years now. It's hard to believe since 9-11. Most importantly, you kept the most solemn oath and commitment to our military to provide citizens of this country the security they need to dream the dreams, raise their families, live full and prosperous lives, even if it means putting your own lives on hold or in jeopardy. That's really what I think of all of you, selfless guardians who have been serving since before 1636. I mean, think about it, that's a long time to the present time that you have provided security to our nation. You've withstood the trials and the hardships of democracy, but we've flourished at every instance when given the opportunity, particularly in the National Guard, you've flourished. On any given day, 30,000, let me say that again, 30,000 Guard soldiers and airmen are mobilized in every region of the world. At the same time, about 10,000 are conducting operations in the United States. This consistent utilization has resulted in a battle-tested guard, an agile, flexible, and deployable force with tremendous combat experience and a broad range of skills gained on the battlefield and in your civilian lives. With the types of challenges that we are morphing into for the future, there's bigger threats, as you know, every day, such as in cyber, space, as well as the impacts from such things as pandemics and urbanization. Our citizen warriors are absolutely critical to our future. The way I see it, the more deeply integrated the Guard becomes in all facets of planning and execution, the more secure we become. The Guard's presence across 2,600 communities in the country and the skills and flexibilities to handle unexpected demands, both here and abroad, is a critical linchpin in the readiness of our nation and for national defense strategy. So with that, let me talk a little bit about our national defense strategy and how all of you fit within that strategy, which is actually quite simple in every facet, right? Every single facet you're involved. Everyone in this room knows that the National Guard we have today is much different than 20 years ago when we had a strategic reserve and guard. So we have changed, and today, after fighting for nearly two decades, the National Guard is an operational force in every way. In fact, your core three missions of warfight, homeland, and partnerships align perfectly with the National Defense Strategy. A few years back, automatic spending caps we had in place. Remember sequestration? Not necessarily the best thing in the world, was it? Especially for planning, for all of you that were out there. We were hampered, it hampered our ability as a nation, and resulted in the smallest U.S. military since before World War II. We had munition shortages, aircraft unable to fly, ships too often unable to get out of port, an aging nuclear deterrent capability, and we had an eroding technological edge over our adversaries in an era of renewed great power competition. The National Defense Strategy was created so that we could emerge from strategic atrophy, and it was atrophy, 
that resulted as a focus on counterinsurgency operations for the last 18 years. The National Defense Strategy focuses the competitive areas of space, cyber. Those are the areas that we're having to compete in today with China and Russia. Now, what this means is that we're going to have to use the full extent of our resources across the full spectrum. By working with our allies, utilizing advanced technology, and most importantly, leveraging our people. Now, leveraging our people, of course, includes utilizing the incredible skills resident within our National Guardsmen and women. Not just the obvious high-tech folks in the corporate world, but also those urban planners that we have out there, physicians, those engineers out there, particularly in light of the fact that we have natural disasters that seem to be hitting our bases and our facilities all around this great country. The National Defense Strategy is broken down into three lines of effort. Rebuilding the military readiness as we build a more lethal force, strengthening alliances as we attract new partners, and reforming the department's business practices for greater performance and affordability. Now, within PNR, we support the National Defense Strategy by ensuring the sustainability and viability of the all-volunteer force with the objective to build a more lethal force. So let me first talk about that first line of effort, lethality. How do we become more lethal? In my view, lethality is tied to readiness. If you're not trained and ready to do your wartime mission, how can you be lethal? We need to be deployable. And that's one of the things that Secretary Mattis, whenever he put forward this national defense strategy, wanted to concentrate on, is the ability to be more lethal. And I will tell you that Secretary Esper, the new Secretary of Defense, believes very strongly as well in this new national defense strategy that we have in place. So the readiness question I'm always asking myself is, are we positioned in a way that maximizes our ability to meet the needs and the objectives outlined in that national defense strategy? Now, with regard to the National Guard, factoring in your large group, your skills, part-time nature of your business model, how do we best position our Guard forces in the joint force and to leverage you to the maximum extent possible? That's, this is constantly on my mind. As a former reservist, 23 years on the reserve side, 14 on the active side, this is something that I always have been concentrating on is how do, are we able to be relevant? How do we remain relevant? The challenge is finding the balance to sustain the National Guard as part of our operational force while also providing a degree of predictability for the most important part of a reservist and guardsman life, our families. And oh, by the way, we have one other thing that the active duty doesn't have to worry about, our employers. And I'm really worried about our employers out there. 18 years of constant deployments, I'm really concerned about our employers out there. This is why when people ask me how family support programs contribute to the lethality, especially for our Guard and Reserve members, family readiness equates to mission readiness in my view. If we don't take care of our families, our service members walk, and that's true, they walk, particularly in the Reserve components because they have that opportunity every single day. If they don't like what we're doing, they can walk. Now, right now, we're competing against market forces, such as low unemployment rate, to hire the best men and women that we have out there in our country. The National Guard can be a fantastic option for individuals who want to serve our country, but don't want to do it full time. We've said that for years. We're a great place to come to work. But we have to have the incentives out there to serve. And that's why innovative thinkings, thinking like TRICARE for our National Guard and Reserve members and duty status reform is so critical, especially when it comes to recruiting and retaining our Reserve and Guard members. Now recently, as you know, Congress expanded transitional TRICARE prime or select coverage for reservists and guardsmen that are activated for more than 120 days, or excuse me, more than 30 days. In the past, you could only get this 
180-day transition coverage if you were part of a contingency operation. Now you can get this benefit regardless of what kind of federal orders you're under, whether it be overseas or stateside federal missions in support of COCOMs. Now, if you think about the national defense strategy and its requirements under the global operating model, the dynamic force employment, and the global force management allocation plan, the GIF map, our guard and reserve members will remain an operational force and continue to deploy as rotational forces around the world. That's our structure right now. That's what the joint staff is using to go ahead and continue to go ahead and rotate forces in and out of the various areas that we have. That's why a benefit like TRICARE transitional coverage is such an important benefit for not only those who are currently serving, but for those who are trying to go ahead and recruit. Now, on the duty status front, we also know that today's system is very complex. As I mentioned earlier, I had 14 years of active duty. When you have 14 years of active duty, most of you know that you deal with the active duty. When they want a guardsman or reservist, they just say, just get them here. I don't care what status, I just need them. I don't care, I don't understand that system, just get them here. And we've had that in place, about 33, depending on how you count it, 33 to 36 different duty statuses that we've had out there. That's just ridiculous. And along with that comes benefits associated with it. It's long overdue to go ahead and reform that. So again, we need to go ahead and make sure that that's fixed. April of this year, the department submitted a comprehensive duty status reform to Congress and we had a bit of, little bit of a glitch at the end. So we weren't able to go ahead and cross the finish line this year, but we think we've worked out the glitches and we'll have that ready to go for 2021. So stay tuned for that, folks, because that's a big one and it does make a big difference. Our reform efforts have been transparent from the very beginning. We've been working with both the reserve, the guard, and the active duty to make sure that we go ahead and make these changes. And we've been working, more importantly, with the tags, which initially we, we weren't necessarily doing with the individual tags, and so there was a glitch at the last minute, but I think we've worked those glitches out. Now, again, this legislation, folks, is almost 1,000 pages long. This is 20 years in the making, 20 years since we've talked about making it more streamlined, more beneficial to each and every one of you. We're almost there. So one of the things I hope you'll take away from this presentation is you need to get out there and support it when it comes before the Congress in 2021, because this will really make a difference to each and every one of you and those guardsmen that you are out there serving, particularly for the senior leadership. Now, let me talk about another item that is near and dear to each and every one of your hearts, and it has to do with the strengthening alliances and attracting new partners. You know, you've had in place the state partnership program for years. I became familiar with it about 15 years ago, a low-cost way in which we could go ahead and build partnerships for the future. I mean, what better way to go ahead and meet this line of effort number two in the national defense strategy? You're already doing it. So why not put the funding in that area and make sure that we go ahead and do this? Because the future leaders of all those various countries you're dealing with. So our future neighbors, you're dealing with those individuals. You're uh, establishing those relationships with them so that in the future we can go ahead and harbor those friendships and use them in time of war. That's why we train together. That's why here in uh, Iowa, I think uh, Tim Orr uh, basically is, was working with... Uh, what state does Iowa have? I mean, what uh, country? That was um, Kosovo. Kosovo, thank you. Had a Kosovo wine last night, so it was very good. But beyond the wine is the training with that particular country. And that's a key ally that we'll need in the future, particularly as we deal with China and Russia, more importantly, Russia. And so the state partnership program, which has been in place for a long period of time, needs to go ahead and continue. And we need to go ahead and build those partnerships for the future. And who does that better than the Guard in that particular area? Now, finally, we need to talk about performance and affordability. The National Defense Strategy's mandate is that we reform our organization. 
We have to ensure our military is establishing a culture of innovation and performance where results and accountability matter on every decision we make. Reservists and guardsmen are, they're innovators. All of you are innovators. Why? Because you're out there. In many cases, as a traditional guardsman, you are out there working in the community. So you're seeing these technological advances that we're having out there. And who better to go to when you're trying to go ahead and do things more efficiently in a better manner, more cost-effective manner, than to go to than each and every one of you. Now, our technological advancements are vast. We have hypersonic weapons now, artificial intelligence, robotics, quantum science, and all of these require a military that's technologically savvy. This is why we need to look for ways to tap into the vast resources that we have out there, and you are a large group with a lot of talent, and we definitely need to tap into each and every one of you. Now, one final thought about reform. It begins with creating a culture to develop problem solvers who feel empowered to speak up with their ideas. And this is a group that I don't have to say that to. As an enlisted, you always, I could always count on it as an officer, I could always count on good inputs from my enlisted corps. And so all of you are already doing that, and you need to go ahead and continue to do that, to speak up with great ideas. Because only through you can we organize for revolutionary change, which is what we're going through right now. So all of you in this room are a part of that. So this is the prepared portion of my speech. Thanks to all of you for listening to it. But more importantly, I'm here to go ahead and listen to each and every one of you to see what's on your mind, to see what I can do to help in this position. So thank you very much. We have the floor mics on. Are there any questions? If you have a question, uh, please step to the microphone. Any questions? Listen, don't be bashful. No one wants to be what we used to call in National War College a spring butt. So, okay, yep. we've got to okay. start it off somewhere. So, Secretary Stewart, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for uh, leaving D.C. and being in God's country out here in Iowa. Uh, appreciate you and Colonel Nyland being here. Uh, could you kind of round out a little bit more about what the duty status reform is, the four buckets that we talk about, and, and uh, what the, uh, what's been proposed maybe a little? So again, it's all tied to benefits, right? We have 33 to 36 duty statuses that we have out there, all based on the various titles in law. So Title 10, Title 32, uh, 14 in the case of the uh, uh, Coast Guard, we need to go ahead and streamline that, folks. Uh, again, we need to have the benefits align with the actual duty status that you're performing. And so what we've done basically is group them such that it makes a lot of sense. We've been doing this for a long period of time. It's taken a lot of work to go ahead and try to go ahead and capture that into the various categories. And so going from the 36 down to eight, which basically, and then down to four, if you will, to streamline it, and with benefit packages associated with those various duty statuses. That's really what we've been trying to do, such that in the case of in the past where we've had, say, an aircraft accident, where you have an air crew, and they were on five different statuses, and so the death benefits to their survivors were five different types of death benefits based on the statuses one for the state, which wasn't necessarily the greatest package available, but the federal obviously was a, a very generous package, and so it varied as to what benefit package you had based on the duty status that you had. It's long overdue to go ahead and get that changed, and that's what we're trying to do. And that's why, again, it impacts so many pieces of current legislation, current de Department of Defense instructions, regulations, not only within the Department of Defense, but other organizations as well. You have to coordinate with Treasury. I mean, it's hard to believe, but you have to go in and coordinate with a number of other organizations out there, the Veterans Administration, all these various organizations to make sure that we have it and we have it right. Now, when the legislation comes out, we have six years to go ahead and implement that legislation. Why? 
Because you're never going to get legislation right the first time, right? I mean, has anyone here seen any legislation that's perfect out there right now? No, right? And so, you know, D.C., do they ever get it 100% right? But bottom line is, that's why the six years is there, is so that we can go ahead and modify, as necessary, the legislation and the regulations that we're going to need, not only within our own organization, DOD, but others as well. And so that's really why it has taken so long. You know, people ask, why has it taken 20 years? It's because it was too hard. It was always too hard. But over time, we've been able to go ahead and work out the kinks. And as I said, I think we're pretty much there. And we've been working with all of your states to make sure that we don't mess it up. And I'll give you one example where the reason why we weren't able to get it across the finish line this year came into play, and for a good reason. So the governor of this great state of Minnesota, Tim Walls, who was a former member of Congress, used to be on the Reserve and Guard Caucus. And he's been watching this for a long, long period of time, but now he's a governor. And ultimately, as a governor, you need to be worried about a clause called the Insurrection Clause. And so the way we had it written in the current legislation didn't quite match up with what this governor and many other governors thought should be in there. And so that's why the tweak, and that's why we will continue to have issues like this as we go through those 900 plus, almost 1,000 pages of legislation to make sure that we don't inadvertently step on either the governor's toes or on federal law. And that's, yet again, why it's been so tough and why so it hasn't happened in the past is because you have all these different legislation, legislation, uh, legislation in place, laws, and regulations. So we're getting there. Hope we uh, talked about it and, and got to your point. But it's long overdue, the duty statuses themselves. What else? No one wants to, I know. I, I've been in your shoes before, folks. I mean, no one wants to go to the mic. No one wants to go ahead and say, hey, I've got a question. But really, use, I, I'm serious. Use this time wisely because, again, I'm here to try to go ahead and hear from you as to what the concerns are for all of you. And who better knows what the issues are than, than each and every one of you? I mean, you reach out there and touch every single enlisted person out there. Yes, sir. Good. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for being here. I do appreciate it. You talked briefly about uh, the impact on our employers, and I was wondering if you could yes. expand upon that. Well, think about it. 18 years of nonstop deployments. You're a small business owner, and you have a very, very small group of individuals working for you. If they're constantly having to rotate in and out every, well, what's our rotation? It's supposed to be four, right? Does that happen? Not always, right? It's two, maybe less. If they're a volunteer, it's one, right? Because again, they like to do this. So, But, but from an employer's perspective, they feel, and I've been hearing them through ESGR, that they really do need to go ahead and have something in place that can perhaps provide an incentive. Um, and so I'm working with them to try to get their ideas as to what we could probably put forward. So is there legislation that needs to be put forward for a tax break maybe, which we've all heard about in years past, but there hasn't necessarily been an appetite for it. But is it long overdue to go ahead and do that? Perhaps, particularly if we're gonna stay a rotational force where we're gonna be constantly asked to go ahead and serve. And right now, with the way we have our setup as an operational reserve, that seems to be the future. And so if we're gonna have a future that requires those individuals to be available to serve their country in that particular fashion, then perhaps it's time to look at that. Go to the back one, Eugene, if that's not working. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you, Eugene. Yep. Great. Uh, Eugene Bradley, State of Kansas. It's working. It's working. So I'll stop yelling. Uh, with a uh, 
transition away from the tech, not, I don't want to say away from the technicians, but transitioning more to an AGR force on the National Guard and the Air National Guard side. It's making, more, making it more difficult to recruit for the critical career fields and keep them ready for the 24-hour jobs that are keeping people away from their families and requiring the high clearances and the extreme hours. In some cases, we're, you know, we're sitting at 40% operational readiness. What is going to be done to make sure that we can still keep up and meet the parity that's equal on the active duty side to be able to offer bonuses that will, again, make these jobs something that we can advertise and fulfill and fill on a regular basis? Are you worried about the AGR force and the total numbers? Uh, no, sir. I, I don't mind the AGR program. I'm an AGR myself. Okay. So this is a little bit of a self-serving question. But... Uh, with the AGRs, we're not, uh, we're not eligible for the same bonus that the active duty parts get. If, we, if I was part-time, I would. But as soon as we become active, we're no longer eligible. So, again, it's a delicate balance. Uh, again, when you're looking at the force overall, you are there to go ahead and help prepare those traditional guardsmen and women in getting prepared for their wartime mission, right? And so that was the whole purpose behind a full-time force, was to make sure that we had individuals that were qualified and trained to make sure that the reserve and guard forces, traditional guard forces, are trained and ready to go. And so how do you go ahead and balance that? I like your question, and I'm looking at that right now as to what is the best mix of AGRs, of traditional guardsmen and reservists. The technician program comes into play as well. And so how do they tie in? And that's something that hasn't been looked at for quite some time. But ultimately, we have to. And here's why I'm, I'm, I'm having uh, right now pause to, to think about it. And that is we have a specific finite budget. So if you looked at my resume, I was a budgeteer. I was an A8 for the Air Force Reserve Command. And so I have to look at it not only from the perspective of the personnel side, but is it affordable? And so you have to make sure that your mix is the proper mix, the most cost-effective mix to get the job done. And so ultimately, when you start talking about the mix of AGRs, and in particular t uh, technicians as well, looking at the cost benefits associated with both and what is the best fit for, for both. Now, when you talk about the benefits, which is the crux of your question, right, is the fact that the AGRs don't necessarily have the bonuses available to them that, say, the, the um, traditional guardsmen have and or the technicians, right? See, that's, that's a fine balance there. So, again, when you look at the costing piece, um, Can I go ahead and get a technician to do the same duty that an AGR can? Are they available as much? And maybe not, which we both know it's not necessarily because it's Title V. In many cases, it's a civilian, right, during the week. And then on the weekends, you're doing your guard duty and or your reserve duty on orders. So as an AGR is full time. That's their primary job, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so, as far as the benefits piece, I have to look at it from what's the driving factor. Well, am I going to go ahead and lose those AGRs if I don't provide those benefits? I don't know. You tell me. That's the struggle right now. You see, my, so I, I don't mean to put the question back on you, but, but the problem is, is what is the right mix? And what are we trying to do? Are we trying to become more operational? If so, that's what we have the active duty there for. I mean, the whole purpose behind having individual AGRs and or technicians there was to go ahead and provide the training to those individual guardsmen and reservists out there that weren't full time, right? And so therein is our difficulty. And so is there a specific area in the AGR world that you wanna go ahead and talk about? bonuses in particular to keep you? You've done, you've, you've done a good job. I think more, my question was more aligned for the critical career fields that are looking at the low manning as the technician spots are disappearing. Um, our AGR positions are remaining unfilled. 
because we don't we can't compete with the easier jobs out there that offer a better lifestyle than the harder career. Yeah, you bet. And again, quite frankly, that's our situation right now is recruiting, right? Is not only in the AGR world, but in our traditional guardsmen and reservists, and quite frankly, from the active force as well. Is with a job market the way it is right now, unemployment at its historic lows, we're really having to go ahead and fight for those individuals that are out there. Keeping in mind that right now, we have about 27% of the American youth between 17 and 24 years old that actually qualify, meeting all of our standards, which are medical, physical, right? So the medical piece, physical piece, the mental piece, all of those factors come into play and then propense to serve, meaning that they want to serve, it's about 1%, 1%. Wow, that's a small group, right? And as you look at it as well, how many of you are either the sons or daughters of a guardsman? There we go. Or how many of you, let's phrase it another way, how many of you actually have sons or daughters that are guardsmen? See? So we're almost inbred, right? Because again, we, well, you think about it. I mean, bottom line is, how do you go ahead and recruit outside of this area? All of us, and I'm a son of an Air Force lieutenant colonel, so I followed in my father's footsteps as well. So, but how do we get outside of that, that, this group here? So that's really the challenges that we're facing now, and that's one of the things that I know the Army, particularly Secretary Esper, whenever he was a Secretary of the Army, was dealing with is, you know, we have this uh, smile that we call, call in uh, the recruiting area where there's certain portions of the country where you can always count on getting your numbers for the recruiting. But he said, okay, I need to go ahead and break that paradigm. I need to look outside of that area and start looking at perhaps some of the bigger cities. So Cleveland, Baltimore, some of those other areas out there that haven't traditionally been huge recruiting pools to go ahead and bring in our future. So that's our problem right now is what do we do for the future as far as bringing folks in? That is a challenge that we face right now. And so that's where we need your help in coming up with great ideas, which all of you have in the past, on how we can go ahead and build our future. Because again, our future isn't just going to be here with all of us who are used to this and have either children or fathers, parents, uh, mothers or fathers serving. So we need to go ahead and make sure that we have a group outside of this to continue to go ahead and provide the defense of this nation. What other questions? My time is yours, folks. Oh, okay, good. Mr. Secretary, thank you uh, for uh, attending the conference. Uh, Mark Wasserbauer from Minnesota. Uh, thank you for also recognizing our uh, newly elected governor, Tim Walls, and, and all the work that he's done with the, uh, well, he's in, uh, in the U.S. House uh, Congress. Uh, you talked a little bit about the restructuring of the codes uh, for the, the, the different title codes for the guardsmen, how that's going to uh, take it down from 30 plus down to eight, potentially four. Uh, I, I'm an AGR myself, but I represent a lot of folks uh, from my unit that are technicians, uh, federal technicians. So in the restructure of the re reclassing of the, of the titles, how do you see the interface or how the, what the impact would be for like the technician unions uh, that the technicians all belong to and how that's going to play in or, or does that even get affected uh, with the restructure? No, it does. I think it's a good point. And again, it's a fine line as to how to go ahead and structure the force for the future. Uh, we're going to be looking at a lot of things, the cost-effectiveness piece, uh, the benefit piece, um, and what makes the most sense for the future. You know, AGRs are very easy. Again, they're 24-7, and it's an easy fix. I had uh, Marianne Miller, who was the former Reserve Chief, Air Force Reserve Chief, who, uh, whenever she was the Chief of the Air Force Reserve, uh, was pushing for a larger group of AGRs. But I, I, I'm concerned about the fact that we have just those 24-7 folks there 
and particularly in light of the fact that they don't necessarily understand our reserve population. The technician, I feel, has a little easier time of it because they're having to go ahead and go from their civil service side to their technician side or their reserve side, excuse me, on the weekends. And they really understand the fact that, hey, I've got my day job and then I have my weekend job too. Uh, and so that distinction is, is, I think, unique and you need to keep in mind. Now, truth in lending, I was an Air Reserve technician. So again, I have a bit of a bias perhaps there, but I'm more concerned about the reason why the full-time piece was put there in the first place. It's mostly for that program, the Guard and Reserve program. That was the whole purpose behind putting the full-time piece there and training those citizen, airmen, soldiers, sailors, coast guardsmen, and women. You gotta go ahead and make sure that you have a trained force that's there to make sure that we have them trained. Because remember, the strength of our program, the strength of the guard, the strength of the reserves is you are in touch with America. The AGRs aren't necessarily technicians not necessarily, but those individuals that are out there in the communities as teachers, engineers, mayors, people that are in those communities, those 2,600 communities that you have in the Guard, those are the ones that we want to go ahead and make sure that we reach and that we maintain that contact with. Because once you lose that, then you have a military class and will be even more isolated. I would argue that the Guard and Reserve is a reason why that we have a great reputation with those folks out in Iowa, Minnesota, Kentucky, all those states out there. It's you. You make the difference. So, again, back to the original question of technician versus AGR. It's important that we have those. I get it. And getting that mix right, got it. And the benefits associated, we need to go ahead and make sure that we're recruiting them because we've got to go ahead and make sure that we have the best qualified individuals there so that we can train our citizen, soldiers, sailors, marine airmen, coast guardsmen. But what's that right mix? Thank you, sir. You bet. Tony McGraw from Ohio. You bet. A question for you, staying with technicians. Um, ADOS, if you go on an ADOS for an AGR job or just on ADOS, you get points. Has, has anyone looked at temporary technicians getting that counted towards a retirement for them? They get nothing. And there are lots of times that temporary technicians go on orders or get hired for three or four years. They get a break in service a little bit, and then they bring them right back on. And it's a great job for them. They love it. The young people love it, but they get nothing in return. Just a thought. I don't know if you guys are looking at that or not. No, but uh, I'd be happy to. In fact, Chris and I will take that back with us to take a look at it. Because, again, as you know, the difference is points, right? And so ultimately it comes down to the points. And depending on your rank, it's a certain number of cents because even as a general officer, it was not in the dollar range per point, right? And so, again, the points is what we base our retirement on. So it is important. Here's the other thing to keep in mind too, the flexibility that you talked about back and forth. You know, even the act of duty now is looking at breaks in service. And so we need to go ahead and look at RATMA and DATMA, both legislations, one for the active, one for the reserve side, as to how we go ahead and bring in individuals into the services. Now, now I'm concentrating on the officer piece, I realize, but, but ultimately how do we go about doing that for the future? Is taking a break, coming back in, making sure that you get the credit and the points, and perhaps the benefits. So what about the TRICARE piece, right? So that's a huge pull, because in today's environment with healthcare and the cost of healthcare, that, I would argue, is one of our benefits that we have that is enticing, particularly for a part-timer, the fact that you have TRICARE reserve. So, but thanks for the input, I appreciate that. And that's kind of the thing I'm looking for, folks. It's an idea here so that we can take back and we can look at it. Secretary, I've got a, another question for you. you um, 
uh, and you just mentioned it, the TRICARE program. Uh, when the law was passed in 2008 to allow for reduced uh, retirement age eligibility from age 60, to, uh, for every 90 days you're deployed, you come off that and you can go all the way down to age 50. The uh, annuity was separated from the TRICARE entitlement. Are we looking at marrying those two back up again? Yeah, that's, and discussions are going on right now. And so it's a great point, um, and we are looking at that. But let me piggyback off that to, to make another comment. So one of the benefits associated with guardsmen and reservists is the fact that we're a bargain for the American taxpayer, right? And so ultimately, as we add benefits on to each and every one of you as far as your package, your pay package, your benefits package, you're not necessarily becoming as much of a bargain as you used to be. So let me just put this in context. Whenever I was the military executive to the Reserve Forces Policy Board, my last job in uniform, we basically did a cost study on the cost of a reserve component member as opposed to an active component member, 33%. Now, the active duty tried to uh, uh, diminish the report, but everyone checked it out, GAO, uh, Congressional Budget Office. I mean, everyone looked at this to make sure that we had done our, our accounting correctly. Each and every time we get a benefit, TRICARE Select for Reserves, uh, let's say we get another benefit down the road, all of that adds to the cost. And so then you now become not as much of a bargain for the American taxpayer. So that's the, that's the thing that I caution about is when we go to sell these programs, we need to make sure that we don't forget that we have been a cost-effective resource for the United States but every time we go ahead and add something on, it's gonna to add to our cost. And so the RFPB right now is looking at it. They took my study that I did in 2013 and are reviewing it right now. They should be coming out with it shortly. I anticipate early indicators are that we're probably now about 36 to 38% of what the cost of an active component member is. Still a bargain, right? But we just need to be cognizant of that as we add these things in. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hey. Hi. Kelsey Lambert from South Dakota. So along with what the discussions from earlier at our base in South Dakota for the air side, a lot of our technician force is converting to AGRs. And with state emergencies, AGRs are limited in the capacity that we can serve. So will the duty reform, will our position descriptions change? or will um, state emergencies solely be kind of on the shoulders of our CE folks or the traditionals and the technicians? That's a good question. So ultimately, PDs will have to be reworked, obviously, uh, and that's where I got into the regulations, everything else that needed to be reworked so that we can match that up. But yes, we'll have to definitely go ahead and do that to make sure that we're providing the same benefits for that particular service. Good question, thank you. Okay, well, if we don't have anything else, we really appreciate your being here with us, Mr. Secretary, and like to uh, send you our Ingus coin as a token of appreciation, and all of the, the answers were great. We really appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate okay. it very much. Thank, thank you all, so appreciate much. it. Sergeant at Arms, please have our distinguished guest escorted from the head table. All right, we're scheduled for a break at this time, so it's gonna be a short, basically a comfort break, but during that time, if you get a chance, still try and hit the vendors. The, our exhibit floor and the silent auction will close at 1,400 hours today. So at this time, we'll go on break until 10.20. Please be back in your seats by 10.20. Thank you. <laughs>